Battle of Isandwana, one of the worst and most famous defeats in British colonial history. Did you know that despite the crushing Zulu victory, there was a surprising number of survivors from amongst the British and their allies? Today, I'm back on the battlefield here at Isandwana to follow the route that many of those survivors took on that fateful day, 22nd of January, 1879. So how many survived the battle? Well, of course, there was five British Imperial officers, i.e. army regulars, but there was also men from the mounted infantry and a decent number of colonial volunteers. I've often read that the number of survivors is between 50 and 60, but that doesn't include black auxiliaries. Let's not forget that Durnford's Natal native horse, despite heavy casualties, managed to maintain some sort of cohesion and fight their way back to Rourke's Drift. No mean feat. Okay guys, so today we're gonna to be hiking along the trail. I'm going with an experienced tour guide, Johan. I'm a tour guide myself, but there's always things to learn and he's really good, knows his stuff. So thanks to him and Pat Rundgren for organizing this today. By the way, if you want to learn more about the Battle of Isandwana, you can sign up for my mailing list over at redcoathistory.com slash newsletter. And when you do so, you'll get your free ebook, which is a guide to the battle. I think you'll really enjoy that. In today's video, I'll be reading the men's accounts and examining the topography of what is now known as the Fugitives Trail. As an aside, I'm not going to be reading accounts of the Zulu warriors, as I'll be doing a separate video covering those in the near future. All of today's accounts, as well as others, can be found in this recent book, Witnesses at Isandwana, by Neil Thornton and Michael Dennigan. So it's hard to imagine now, but where I'm walking along this path would have been absolute chaos on the day of the 22nd of January. There would have been cattle here making terrible noise. There would have been thousands of Zulu warriors streaming down, stabbing, shooting. The British soldiers with their Martini Henrys probably using up their last rounds to defend themselves. It would have been absolutely horrific. So these days, as you travel along the path, there are a lot of stone, white stone cairns, as there are around the battlefield. These would have been survivors putting up a last stand along the fugitive's trail before they were wiped out. We don't know exactly who's buried under here. It'll be just a pile of whatever bones were found long after the battle was finished. So let's start off with Captain Edward Essex. He had passed out from Sandhurst in 1867 and joined the 75th Regiment of Foot. In 1878, he had completed his staff college course and volunteered for service in South Africa. On the day of the battle, he was fulfilling his duties as a transport officer attached to the centre column. Here's an excerpt from his account of the day. The 24th men, he means the 24th Regiment, however, were as cheery as possible, making remarks to one another about their shooting, and the enemy opposed to them made little progress but they were now within 500 yards of our line. The two companies which had been moved from the hill were now getting short of ammunition, so I went to the camp to bring up a fresh supply. I got such men as were not engaged, bandsmen, cooks, etc., to assist me and sent them up to the line under charge of an officer, and I followed with more ammunition in a mule cart. In loading the latter, I helped the quartermaster of the 2nd Battalion of the 24th to place the boxes in the cart, and while doing so, the poor fellow was shot dead. The enemy's fire was now increasing and I could hear the whiz of bullets all over the place. I noticed that our natives were now running away by twos and threes. I looked around and was horrified to see that the enemy had nearly surrounded us and was beginning to fire from the rear, coming up in that direction at a tremendous pace. The right of the 24th was now turned and the men became unsteady. A few fixed bayonets and I heard the officers calling on their men to keep together and be steady. It was, however, no use. In a few seconds the whole field was a rabble and the Zulus were among us. We were driven up through the camp towards the road by which we had arrived, men falling right and left. The road immediately in rear of our camp led across a sort of neck between two hills. By the time we arrived here the retreat had become a stampede, horses, mules, oxen, wagons, all being carried in the same direction. The worst was yet to come. On gaining the neck we found the circle our enemy had drawn round us was nearly complete. The only space not yet occupied by them being a rugged and deep dry watercourse to the left of the road. A rush was made to gain this before the enemy, and I gave myself up for lost. I had, thank God, a very good horse and a very sure-footed one. But I saw many poor fellows roll over their horses stumbling over the rocky ground. It was now a race for dear life. The Zulus kept up with us on both sides, being able to run down the steep rocky ground quite as fast as a horse could travel. Essex survived and made it to the encampment at Heltmakar, over 15 miles away. 
Here he and a handful of others prepared what defences they could and stood waiting for a Zulu attack that never materialised. Essex continued to fight the Zulus and was present during the Second Invasion and the Battle of Ulundi. He also fought in the First Anglo-Boer War, a.k.a. Transvaal Rebellion, and was given the nickname Lucky Essex. Another interesting story is Lieutenant Smith Dorian of the 95th. He later became a corps commander and army commander in World War I, leading the British forces at Mons and Le Cateau in 1914. But in 1879, he was a transport officer working alongside the Royal Artillery. On the afternoon of the 22nd of January, as the Battle of Isandwana was clearly being lost, and because he wasn't in command of any troops, he made a dash for it. He's left as this account. Everybody then who had a horse turned to fly. The enemy were going at a kind of very fast half walk and half run. On looking around, we saw that we were completely surrounded and the road to Rourke's Drift was cut off. The place where they seemed thinnest was where we all made for. Everybody went pell-mell over ground covered with huge boulders and rocks until we got to a deep sprate or gully. How the horses got over, I've no idea. I was riding a broken kneed old croc, which did not belong to me and which I expected to go on its head every minute. We had to go bang through them at the spray. Lots of our men were killed there. I had lots of marvellous escapes and was firing away at them with my revolver as I galloped along. The ground there down to the river was so broken that the Zulus went as fast as the horses and kept killing all the way. This lasted till we came to a kind of precipice down to the Buffalo River. I jumped off and led my horse down. There was a poor fellow of the mounted infantry, a private, struck through the arm, who said as I passed that if I could bind up his arm and just stop the bleeding, he would be all right. I accordingly took out my handkerchief and tied up his arm. Just as I'd done it, Major Smith of the artillery came down by me, wounded, saying, for God's sake, get on, man, the Zulus are on top of us. I'd done all I could for the wounded man and so turned to jump on my horse. Just as I was doing so, the horse went with a bound to the bottom of the precipice, being struck with an assegai. I gave up all hope as the Zulus were all around me, finishing off the wounded, and the man I had helped a Major Smith among the number. However, with the strong hope that everybody clings to and that some accident would turn up, I rushed off on foot and plunged into the river, which was little better than a roaring torrent. I was being carried down the stream at a tremendous pace when a loose horse came by me and I got hold of its tail and he landed me safely on the other bank. But I was too tired to stick to him and to get on his back. I got up again and rushed on and was several times knocked over by our mounted black soldiers who would not get out of the way and then up a tremendous hill with my clothes wet and my boots full of water. A few Zulus followed us for about three miles across the river, but they had no guns and I had a revolver, which I kept letting them know. Also, the mounted black soldiers stopped a little and kept firing at them. They did not come in close and finally stopped altogether. Well, to cut it short, I struggled in to help my car about 20 miles off at nightfall to find a few men who had escaped, about 10 or 20, with others who had been entrenched in a wagon lager. He was certainly another lucky bugger. Now, for those of you looking to travel to the battlefields, for this trip, I stayed at the Rourke's Drift Hotel, which is literally positioned right on the drift, right on the old wagon trail where the invasion started. They can be found at rourkesdrifthotel.com. They're not paying me for this, but I always have a good time there, and I thought I'd share the details. So the final account I want to share today is that of a translator attached to the central column called James Brickhill. Let's join his recollection in the afternoon, just as the Zulus are about to burst into the camp. Going down to the first 24th camp, I saw Mr. Dubois, who asked me in Zulu how it looked. I replied, ugly, and said, yes, the enemy have scattered us this day. Panic was everywhere and no officer to guide, no shelter to fall back upon. So seeing that the Zulus were already stabbing in this camp as well as the others, I joined the fugitives retreating over the neck, on reaching which I found all communication by the road we'd come along cut off by several lines of Zulus running across. They had come along behind Isandlwana and thus intercepted our retreat. The Zulus' left horn had now come over the ridge south of the stony copy. They could have completed their circle, but I think they preferred leaving the gap so that they might attack us in our rear. Our flight I shall never forget. No path, no track, boulders everywhere. On we went, borne into some dry torrent bed, now weaving our way amongst trees of stunted growth, so that unless you make the best use of your eyes, you are in constant danger of colliding against some tree or finding yourself unhorsed at the bottom of some ravine. Our way was already strewn with shields, assegais, blankets, hats, clothing of all description. Band Sergeant Gamble, tottering and tumbling about amongst the stones, said, for God's sake, give me a lift. I said, my dear fellow, it's a case of life and death with me, and closing my eyes, I put spurs to my horse and bounded ahead. That was the last I saw of him. 
got to respect his honesty there, haven't you? I think most people would have lied about that. The next person I came upon, also a soldier, said, well, I'm jumped, I'm done. The Zulus can just come and stab me if they like. And he just sat quietly on a stone awaiting death. You can see how steep and difficult this terrain is. Imagine now being stabbed, being shot at. There's horses going crazy, there's cattle everywhere. Hard to imagine it, isn't it? Whilst going down into a deep torrent bed, I saw Lieutenants Melville and Coghill and Conductor Foley about 200 yards ahead, only more to our right. A stream of Zulus running on their right was fast pressing them down towards the course we were on. Scrambling over this rocky bed as best we could, we came up a hill on this side, fully exposed to the enemy's rear and crossfire. We came to an abrupt halt by reason of a huge chasm or gully, which opened up to view in front of our horses. There was nothing for it but to turn sharply around and follow the course of the gully down in the hope of finding another crossing. A mounted infantryman, impatient of our Indian file type of following one another, put his horse at the gully. It was a noble looking grey but the horse fell far short and the rider lay crushed beneath his horse about 12 feet below. We found a crossing to the gully but so deep that on coming out on the other side I laced my arms around my horse's neck and threw my head forward as far as possible. And even then, it remains a mystery how our horses got out of this without falling over backwards. A little further, I found Mr. Melville carrying the colours that was just in front of me. Some of Durnford's horse, the Basutus, who were a little in front, stopped now and then and took a shot at the enemy and rode on again. I overheard one of them tell his companion that he knew the way across country to the missionary and they agreed if they escaped to take that course. Knowing that everybody else who escaped would make for help Makar, I decided if I escaped to keep with them so that I might appraise the mission station of the true state of affairs. So this is the Manzinyama River. It's very, very steep riverbanks. And this is as far as the majority of people got. Going down to the Manzinyama Blackwater River, we had some very bad country. So bad that we all got off and led our horses. Here we were compelled to take one narrow pass. The fleeing party all converged there. There was a great crush. Seeing the danger of Melville's position, for there was a steep precipice on his immediate left, I backed my horse and kept all the others back as well as I could, as a collision there might have sent him and his horse rolling for several yards. It was then that I became aware that Mr Coghill was just behind, as he shouted, Get on your horses there, Mr T. There's no time to be leading a horse. Get on your horse, you fellows there. Someone near him said, You get off yours. This is no place to be riding one. I did not know then that he suffered from an injured knee and could not walk. So most of those fugitives emerged at the top of this hill. They tried to work their way down here, down to the Buffalo River, which on that day was much, much deeper than this, fast flowing. You can imagine it, all of this was deep water. So on I sped. Reaching the Buffalo, we found it rolling high. No time for choosing the best crossing then. There were the Zulus in running lines making for the stiller water higher up. My horse plunged in swimming at once, but had scarcely gone six yards before he stumbled over something large. But on we sped, catching up many native fugitives. I sent word to Mr Woodroff that our camp had been taken and that the Zulus were in pursuit. We did not feel out of danger, even temporarily, until we had reached the Reverend Mr Webber's station. Brickhill was one of the men who later returned to recover the bodies of Lieutenants Melville and Coghill. They are now buried here on the Natal side of the river. Theirs is a fascinating story and a little bit controversial and one I'm going to come back to in a future video, so watch this space.